Here are the order of magnitude of the electromagnetic spectrum. The wavelength range of visible light is between 400 to 700 nanometers. Be sure to have this memorized. Therefore, the wavelength of the photon must be between 400 and 700 nanometers since it is visible light. The answer is 500 nanometers. In addition and subtraction, we need to first find the absolute uncertainty before finding the percentage uncertainty. Let's go through one option at a time. The mass of P plus Q is 50. The absolute uncertainty of P plus Q is 2 since P and Q each have an absolute uncertainty of 1. The percentage uncertainty can be found by dividing the absolute uncertainty with its quantity multiplied by 100. The percentage uncertainty of P plus Q will be 2 over 50 multiplied by 100, which gives us 4%. Do the same with option B. The absolute uncertainty remains the same, but the quantity of mass changes. The percentage uncertainty will be calculated to 20%. In multiplication and division, the percentage uncertainty can be found by multiplying the fractional uncertainty by 100. The fractional uncertainty can be found by adding all the fractional uncertainties. The fractional uncertainty of the product of option C and D will be the same, therefore the percentage uncertainty will also be the same. The percentage uncertainty is approximately slightly less than 10%. The least percentage uncertainty is option A with 4%. Displacement is the shortest distance between two points. To find the magnitude of the displacement between x and y, use the Pythagoras theorem. Let's start with the three Suvat equations with acceleration. For this question, the initial velocity u is v1, the final velocity v is v2, and the time taken t is t2 minus t1. The two equations shown here can be rearranged to get the equations in option 2 and 3. The last equation can be arranged to something similar but not the same as the equation in option 1. Therefore, only options 2 and 3 are correct. First, let us focus on the vertical movement of the ball. The initial vertical velocity is u and the acceleration of free fall is g. The velocity at maximum height is 0. Use v squared equals u squared plus 2 as to find the maximum height h in terms of u and g. Do the same calculation for the planet but this time the acceleration is tripled. Substitute in for h and we can see that the new maximum height is a third of the original maximum height. Before we move on to find the maximum range, we need to find the time taken for the ball to reach its maximum height. Use v equals u plus at to find the time taken t in terms of u and g. Do the same calculation for the planet with the tripled acceleration. Substitute in for t. The time taken is a third of that of Earth. Note that the time taken for the planet can also be found by having the ball fall back to its initial vertical position. Now let's focus on the horizontal movement of the ball. The horizontal distance of the ball, in this case, the range, can be found by multiplying the horizontal speed with the time taken. This calculation is possible since there is no horizontal acceleration. Since the time taken on the planet is a third of its initial time taken, the range is also a third of its initial range. Terminal velocity means that the ball is falling at constant velocity. The upward air resistance equals the downward weight. Resultant force is zero, therefore acceleration is zero. Total energy is the sum of the kinetic energy and potential energy. Although the kinetic energy remains constant, the gravitational potential energy decreases as the ball falls closer to the ground. Therefore, total energy also decreases. Here is the free body diagram of the rotating ball. The tension can be split into its vertical and horizontal components by using trigonometry. From this diagram, we can see that the net force of the horizontal component is T sine theta. Note that this is also the centripetal force. The question tells us that the ball is rotating along a horizontal circle. This means that there is no vertical acceleration, which means that there is no vertical resultant force. T cos theta equals mg.
Use F equals MA to find the magnitude of the resistive force. The resultant force is 4 newtons minus the resistive force. Put in the values given in the question to find that the resistive force equals 2 newtons. Next, increase the force to 8 newtons. Subtract resistive force of 2 newtons to find the resultant force. Rearrange and calculate to find the acceleration. First, let's find the output power. The output power can be found by multiplying the efficiency with the input power. Here is a visual representation of the power going into and out of the motor. There are two ways to approach this question. First, we can calculate the gravitational potential energy gained in one second. Power outputs of 80 watts times one second equals 80 joules. Rearrange the equation for gravitational potential energy to make height the subject, Substitute in the values to find the answer. Another way is to divide the gravitational potential energy with time to change it to rate of gain in gravitational potential energy, which is also the output power. Likewise, rearrange to make height the subject. Substitute in the values to find the answer. Elastic collision is when the total kinetic energy of the objects colliding stay the same after the collision. Kinetic energy is conserved. Inelastic collision is when the kinetic energy is not conserved. Kinetic energy before the collision does not equal the kinetic energy after the collision. Note that the total energy itself remains the same. Since the speed of the ball changes after the bounce, so does its kinetic energy. Therefore, this is an inelastic collision. Change in temperature is the same whether the units of the temperature is in degrees Celsius or Kelvin since they both have the same scale. If you are ever unsure, always feel free to make up numbers to check. Here are two temperatures, 10 and 50 degrees Celsius. The difference is the same even when the units are changed to Kelvin. Temperature does not change between section Q, R. Temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles. We know this from the equation given in the data booklet. Therefore, we can conclude that the kinetic energy of the molecules is constant for section Q, R. Note that during state change, the potential energy of the particles changes, but the kinetic energy of the particles remains the same. Here is the summary of what we know of X and Y. Let's assume that the temperature of block X is greater than block Y. The thermal energy lost by X will equal to the thermal energy gained by Y. The amount of energy change is the change in the internal energy of the block. Since Y gains the same amount of energy that X lost, the change in internal energy of block Y is also delta U. Use the equation given in the data booklet and put in the values. Rearrange to find the change in temperature of y. The answer will be 2 delta t. Fact! Only transverse waves can be polarized. Transverse waves such as electromagnetic waves can be polarized. Longitudinal waves such as sound waves cannot be polarized. The principle of superposition states that when two or more same type of waves meet, the total displacement at any point is the sum of the displacements that each individual wave would cause at the point. Let's say that the amplitude of the resultant wave at point P is A. The only way this is possible is when two waves each with amplitude of half A undergo constructive interference at point P. In conclusion, the sources have half the amplitude of that at point P. Intensity is directly proportional to the amplitude squared. If the amplitude halves, the intensity will decrease by a quarter. First, let's have a look at the graph. Gradient is y over x. y is sine r and x is sine i. The question tells us that the gradient is m. The ray enters the glass from the air. Use the equation given in the data booklet to derive an equation between the refractive index and the angles. The angle in the glass is r and the angle in the air is i. Sine r over sine i is m as we found previously. The refractive index in the air is 1. Rearrange to find 
find the refractive index of glass in terms of M. Now let's focus on the critical angle. A critical angle occurs when the ray from a more dense medium, in this case the glass, refracts at 90 degrees to a less dense medium, in this case the air. Use the same equation from the data booklet. Now the angle in the air is 90 degrees and the angle in the glass is the critical angle. Substitute in all the information that we know, rearrange to find the critical angle in terms of M. Here are the first three harmonics of a standing wave formed on a string fixed at both ends. First, determine the wavelength in terms of the length L of the pipe. Next, use the equation given in the data booklet to find the frequency of the standing wave. Leave the speed of wave as C. Frequency of the first harmonic is C over 2L, and the frequency of the third harmonic is 3C over 2L. Divide F1 with F3, cancel out, to find your answer. Some background information. First, here are the electric field patterns for a negative point charge and a positive point charge. The electric field is always directed towards the negative point charge and away from the positive point charge. Next, here are two charges. The electric field strength at a distance from the large charge can be calculated by dividing the force on the small charge by the charge of the small charge. Substitute the equation for the electrostatic force on the small charge into the previous equation. Both equations are given in the data booklet. It turns out that the electric field strength is inversely proportional to the distance squared. This equation is not in the data booklet, so make sure to have it memorized. At position A, the fields due to the two charges both point to the left. This means that the net electric field will always point to the left. At position D, the fields due to the two charges both point to the right. This means that the net electric field will always point to the right. At position C, the field due to 2Q will be greater than the field due to Q since 2Q has the greater charge and the position is closer to 2Q. As a result, the net electric field will always point to the left. In position B, the field produced by 2Q is weaker since the distance is greater. Therefore, it is possible for the two fields to have the same magnitude and cancel each other out, resulting in zero net electric field. Resistance is directly proportional to the length. Since y has double the length than x, it has double the resistance than x. The currents passing through x and y are equal since they are in series. The power dissipated in x is i squared r, which the question also tells us is p. Now to find the power dissipated in y. The resistance of y is 2r. Rearrange slightly and substitute in for p to find your answer. The two circuits shown in the question are identical. Therefore, the current through L is also the same. Here are other ways to draw the circuit shown in the question. All these diagrams are identical. Derive a relationship between the speed and the radius to solve this question. The path of the electron inside the magnetic field is circular. This means that there is a centripetal force acting on the electron. There is a magnetic force on the electron since the movement of the electron is perpendicular to the magnetic field. The magnetic force on the electron acts as the centripetal force in this scenario. Use the equations given in the data booklet and simplify. Since B, Q, and M are constants, V and R will be directly proportional to each other. Therefore, the speed radius graph would look like this, where the line is linear and passes through the origin. Let's go through one force at a time. The weight acts on the center of mass and always points downwards. Normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. Since the surface here is vertical, the normal force is to the right. Frictional force always acts in the opposite direction to the motion. You can imagine that the motorcycle slips downwards if there was no frictional force. Put these forces together to find your answer. 
The key word here is above the Earth's surface. This means that the total radius when the satellite in space is 5 over 4h. Use the equation given in the data booklet to derive an equation for the surface and at height h. Divide them together, cancel out, and simplify to find your answer. Photons are emitted when electrons in a higher energy level transitions to a lower energy level. The wavelength of the emitted photon can be seen on an emission spectrum. The energy of the photon equals to the energy difference between the energy levels. This means that the larger the difference in energy levels, the shorter the wavelength of the photon, as we can see from the equation given in the data booklet. Here is another electron transition, but this time from a higher energy level. On the emission spectrum, we can see See that the emitted photons have a shorter wavelength. There are three relatively small energy level differences, which means we can expect to see three long wavelengths. There is one large energy level difference, which means we can expect to see one short wavelength. Put them together and your answer should look like this. Statement 1 and 2 can be deduced from the rutherford geiger marsden scattering experiment. Statement 3, which refers to discrete energy levels, is deduced from emission spectrum. The half-life is defined as the time taken for the number of nuclei that have not yet decayed to fall to half its initial value. Initially, the amount of undecayed nuclei is 100%. After one half-life, this amount falls to 50%, and the amount of decayed nuclei increases from 0 to 50%. After another half-life, the amount of undecayed nuclei is 25%, and the amount of decayed nuclei is 75%. Two half-lives have passed for 75% of the pure sample to decay. Therefore, the answer is 12 days. A reminder that a baryon is a particle made of three quarks and thus have a baryon number of plus one. A meson is a particle made of a quark and an anti-quark and thus have a baryon number of zero. Here is the interaction between a proton and a pion. The proton is a baryon made of two up quarks and one down quark, which gives us a baryon number of plus one and charge of plus one. The rest of the particles are mesons and so have a baryon number of zero. We know this as as each particle consists of one quark and one anti-quark. The charge can be figured out from adding the charges of the quarks or by looking at the charge on the top right side of the particle symbol as shown with red circles here. Only the particle with the strange quark will have the strangeness of minus one. All other particles do not have the strange quark and therefore will have zero as strangeness. From the values that we wrote, we can see that the baryon number and the strangeness are violated in this interaction while the charge charge is conserved. Statement 1 is true. Carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere during volcanic activity. Statement 2 is false. Carbon dioxide is dissolved in seawater. Increasing the solubility decreases the rate of global warming. And lastly, statement 3 is true. Rate at which plants take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis decreases as the trees are cut down. First, let's derive an equation with emissivity and peak wavelength. Combine the power and intensity equation given in the data booklet. Then substitute in for temperature using Wayne's displacement law. Rearrange to make the emissivity the subject. From here, we can derive that the emissivity is directly proportional to the peak wavelength to the power of 4 since everything else is a constant. This means that if the peak wavelength increases by 2, the emissivity increases by 16. This is just one way of solving the questions. Now let's move on to the calculation. Here is the summary of the information given to us. Surface X emits a radiation of peak wavelength twice that of Y. Divide the equation for X and Y, cancel out to find your answer. Albedo is the total scattered intensity divided by the total incident intensity. Note that albedo can also be found using power or energy. Use the equation previously shown to find the albedo of concrete and snow. Put them together and do some simple calculations to find your answer.